In a world torn by revolution, one man's relentless ambition will help forge a nation. This winter, embark on an epic 12-part journey through the tumultuous times of America's founding in our new series, Hamilton at War. A short distance away from the guns, a group of Hessians clawed their way through the blinding white smoke, unaware of Hamilton's cannons pointed directly at them. Hamilton gave the deadly order, give fire! Bodies disappeared in a gray cloud that turned red. Hamilton at War is not just an audio series, it's an immersive journey through time. The Revolutionary Series begins November 1st on your favorite podcast platform. Welcome to D-Day in 90 Minutes, our 15-part weekly podcast series that delves deep into the historic Allied invasion that turned the tide of World War II. I'm Robert Child, and I hope you enjoy this latest installment. D-Day in 90 Minutes, written by William Bradle, Robert Child, narrated by Travis. Utah Beach. We're going to start the war from here, Brigadier General Theodore Roosevelt. The landing on Utah Beach resulted in the fewest casualties of any beach, with 200 men wounded, killed, or missing. Of course, casualties are always high if you are personally involved. But by D-Day standards, Utah was a cakewalk. But a cakewalk only because of a mistake. The U.S. 4th Infantry Division landed on the wrong end of the beach. A lone control boat, confused by bombardment smoke obscuring the landmarks and caught in a strong tide, directed the first wave to a beach a mile south of the intended target. The wave landed at exit two, with only one road coming off the beach. The fourth was supposed to land at exits three and four, which had two roads exiting and covered by the 101st Airborne. The actual landing site had been suggested by the Army in the planning stage, but rejected by the Navy, as the waters near the beach were judged too shallow for the ships to get in close to shore. General Theodore Roosevelt had an executive decision to make. Roosevelt, the oldest son of President Theodore Roosevelt, graduated from Harvard like his father. He then went to France as a member of the American Expeditionary Force in World War I. He was wounded and gassed during the war, and returned to the United States in 1919. His brother, Quentin, was a fighter pilot killed in a dogfight in 1918. Ted founded the American Legion. After World War I, Roosevelt entered politics and was named Assistant Secretary of the Navy. He was involved in granting leases that became known as the Teapot Dome Scandal. He was cleared of all charges, but his cousin, Franklin Roosevelt, used the scandal against him when Ted ran for governor of New York. Eleanor Roosevelt followed Ted to his campaign events around the state, driving a car with a steaming teapot on the roof. Ted never forgave her. He lost the election. Eleanor said she was duped by Democratic Party dirty tricksters, but it is hard to believe she didn't notice the teapot on the roof of the car. When Franklin Roosevelt was elected president, Ted was asked about his relation to the new president. He quipped, fifth cousin about to be removed. In the 30s, he entered private business, becoming a vice president at Doubleday Books and chairman of the board of American Express. When America entered the war, he rejoined his old unit, the 26th Infantry Regiment. Roosevelt in North Africa ran afoul of both George S. Patton and Omar Bradley for not being a harsh disciplinarian, prompting Bradley to write of Roosevelt and another general officer, they loved their division too much. Roosevelt was named to the staff of the 4th Infantry Division as a planner. He petitioned to participate in the invasion, but was denied. He finally received approval after sending a handwritten note to the division commander, stating, It will steady the boys to know I am with them. Permission granted. Early in the morning of the invasion, Roosevelt came in the first wave to the wrong end of the beach, wearing a wool cap because he hated helmets, using a cane because he had a heart condition and arthritis, and carrying a Colt 45. Roosevelt was the only general officer on D-Day to land with the first wave. Some of his men didn't appreciate his presence. Wandering into an area where engineers were trying to blow obstacles, one engineer yelled, Go knock that bastard down! He's going to get killed! 
Roosevelt heard the yell and moved on. The general gathered his staff, knowing the invasion was in the wrong place. He had only one road exit if he stayed, and 30,000 men coming in from the ships. He decided to ignore the plan objectives, move forward, and meet and destroy any Germans they encountered inland. The key was to get off the beach as quickly as they could. Roosevelt turned to his staff. I'm going forward with the troops. You get word to the Navy to bring them in. We're going to start the war from here. Roosevelt died of a heart attack in Normandy on July 12, 1944. General Omar Bradley had changed his opinion of Roosevelt and on the same day signed an order promoting Roosevelt to Major General of the 90th Infantry Division. Roosevelt is buried next to his brother Quentin in the American Cemetery overlooking Omaha Beach. Theodore Roosevelt, Jr. was awarded the Medal of Honor on September 28, 1944. His father was awarded the Medal of Honor by President Bill Clinton on January 16, 2001. The only other father-son team to win the Medal of Honor was General Arthur MacArthur for service in the Civil War and General Douglas MacArthur for service in World War II. Other notable men on Utah Beach were Elliot Richardson, the future U.S. Attorney General, who would resign rather than fire Special Prosecutor Archibald Cox in the Watergate investigation, and J.D. Salinger, author of Catcher in the Rye. Utah Beach is also the nexus of the real story on which the movie Saving Private Ryan is based. There were three Nyland brothers serving on D-Day and one brother serving in Burma. Sergeant Bob Nyland, a paratrooper in the 101st Airborne, was killed on June 6th after volunteering to stay behind manning a machine gun to blunt a German advance. Lieutenant Preston Nyland was killed near Utah Beach on June 7th. Sergeant Edward Nyland was shot down in a B-25 over Burma and assumed dead. Their mother received three telegrams on the same day, notifying her of her son's deaths. The fourth son, Fritz, is played by Matt Damon in the movie. He was never lost in action, but the Army did pull him out of the front lines. Edward Nyland survived in a Japanese POW camp that was liberated in 1945. The Nyland tragedy and the Borgstrom family tragedy, where four out of five sons lost their lives in World War II, resulted in the sole survivor policy. Any sole survivor of a family will be pulled from active service. The last time the policy was invoked was 2011, after Jeremy and Ben Wise were killed in action in Afghanistan. A third son, Bo, was taken out of active military service. Roosevelt's decision to advance up Exit 2 was the correct one, but the road was soon clogged with men and equipment, resulting in a giant traffic jam. The decision was made to cross over land, or actually over water, with the order given to advance through the fields flooded by the Germans. The infantry marched on toward Cherbourg, meeting the paratroopers dropped behind the lines to secure the routes into the beach. The success of D-Day at Utah is primarily due to the flexible thinking and decisive actions taken on the beach, coupled with the paratroopers holding the roads and keeping the Germans out. Omaha Beach, the end of the beginning. But they did it so that the world could be free. Dwight D. Eisenhower. At 8.30 a.m. on June 6, 1944, additional landings on Omaha were canceled. There were too many men on the beach stacked up behind obstacles or behind the seawall. This was the critical moment. The invasion would either fail or succeed at this point. It would only succeed if men started getting off the beach. There were 5,000 soldiers on shore, which meant 5,000 potential dead or captured Americans. On the USS Augusta, General Omar Bradley contemplated issuing evacuation orders. On the beach, leaders and training began to emerge. Men started forward, crawling, blowing up or cutting paths through barbed wire, going through minefields. Captain Robert Walker of the 116th Regiment started up the beach, passing many dead bodies, all facing forward. General Norman Cota landed with the 116th Regiment in the second wave. He yelled over to another battle group, What outfit is this? Someone yelled back, 
Fifth Rangers, Coda replied. Well, goddammit then, Rangers, lead the way. Rangers lead the way is now the official slogan of the Rangers. Colonel George A. Taylor rallied the men of the 16th Infantry Regiment with a blunt truth. There are two kinds of men staying on this beach, those who are dead and those who are going to die. Now, let's get the hell out of here. The commander of the 116th, Colonel Charles D. Canham, waving a bloody bandaged hand and a Colt 45, moved among his men, exhorting them to get off the beach, declaring, They're murdering us here. Let's move inland and get murdered. They did. Wounded 2nd Lieutenant Donald Anderson gathered up the courage to get up, and at that point I changed from a rookie in combat to a veteran. Others inspired men with bravado, like Ranger Sergeant Bill Courtney, who yelled down to his men, Come on up. The son of a bitches are cleaned out. A German machine gun opened up. Courtney fell to the ground, threw two grenades, and yelled out again. Come on, the SOBs are cleaned out now. Private Carl Wiest and Captain George Whittington spotted and circled around a German machine gun position, holding three Germans. One of the Germans wanted to surrender, jumping up and yelling, Beta, Beta, Beta! Whittington killed all three with his machine gun, turning to Wiest, saying, I wonder what Beta means. At 1.30 p.m., Bradley received this message from shore. Troops formerly pinned down on beaches, Easy Red, Easy Green, Fox Red, advancing up heights behind beaches. At the end of June 6, 1944, the invaders at Omaha Beach would be one mile inland. In total, 175,000 Allied soldiers were ashore on the Normandy beaches, a front stretching 50 miles, but only six miles inland at the greatest point. Historians will forever argue among themselves that the Allies won because of American industrial might or British technology. They will say Germany's defeat was inevitable because of Hitler's mistakes. It was probably Hitler himself who knew the key to the battle best with this summation. The destruction of the enemy's landing attempt means more than a purely local decision on the Western Front. It is the sole decisive factor on the whole conduct of the war, and hence in its final result. Once defeated, the enemy will never again try to invade, and invasion failure would also deliver a crushing blow to British and American morale. In the end, it was not America's overwhelming industrial might, or Hobart's funnies or strategy, that won the battle and the war. It was the soldiers who had to drop into the water when the ramp went down and advance into the fire. They won the war. Eisenhower said it best. It just shows what free men will do rather than be slaves. I hope you've enjoyed this final episode of the series. Thanks for listening. I'm Robert Child, and this has been D-Day in 90 Minutes, only on Point of the Spear. Music licensed from audioblocks.com. Point of the Spear is produced by RSC Media Group.